Hello YouTube, sometimes I consider creationists a low-hanging fruit, but Creation Training Initiative has a four-part series on mankind, God's greatest creation, that is just screaming to be debunked. And yes, I will be doing all four parts in this one video. We're starting a new four-part series called Mankind, God's Greatest Creation. So our challenge question to this series will be, did humans evolve by naturalistic processes over millions of years? Or we were created by an all-knowing, all-powerful Creator God. We evolved. Wow, that was simple. I, I hope the rest of the series is this easy. Now, the first part of this series is called The Incredible Human Body, A Challenge to Evolution. And I'd like to start by reading from Psalm 139, verse 14, where it states, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Wait, don't tell me. I'm recording this before I've watched this, so I'm going to guess that you'll list a ton of facts about how amazing the human body seems and how there must be no way in hell that this could have come about naturally, right? I'm even waiting for by accident or by chance to come out of your mouth or the whole idea of irreducible complexity. Anyways, proceed. Tell us more. Did you know an adult human being is made up of about seven octillion atoms? That's seven followed by 27 zeros. The human body is made of about 60 trillion cells. In each second, 10 million cells die and are being replaced. Everyone has a unique tongue print, just like we have unique fingerprints. There are about 9,000 taste buds on the surface of the tongue, in the throat, and on the roof of the mouth. The surface area of a human lung is equal to about half a tennis court. Okay, we get it. Our bodies are pretty amazing. Let's skip to a point. The conclusion we can draw is that the tremendous complexity in the human body refutes evolutionism. The logical answer is that every human body is a testimony to an all-powerful, all-knowing Creator God. Wow, your argument is even more underwhelming than I had hoped. It's so complex, so God must have done it, is not an argument. By the same token, one could claim the eleven herbs and spices are so complex and impossibly mixed, they could only come about through the magic of enchanted chicken fairies. Complexity does not necessarily imply creation. Creation is determined by contrasting it to what's natural. We know, for example, a watch is man-made because it doesn't happen in nature. We know from experience that watches are something that is constructed by people. And even someone who has no knowledge of how watches are made can compare the design of a watch to other man-made things to show similarities and come to a reasonable conclusion. We don't recognize things are created because they're complex. A snowflake is very complex compared to a fidget spinner, but one happens in nature, the other does not. But anyways, on to part two. Now here in part two, we're going to talk about junk DNA. Does this really prove that we evolved from ape-like creatures? Oh, yes! Now, he goes on for a couple minutes telling us just what DNA is and how we found out about it, so I'll skip that so we can get once again to a bloody point. Well, let's look at the real facts. Lay it on me. Let's see what pearls of wisdom this clam has to offer. Modern technology has now killed the concept of junk DNA. This occurred after the completion of the Human Genome Project and the ENCODE Project. Now, ENCODE stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. The project began in 2003 as an outgrowth of the Human Genome Project, and it lasted for nine years. The project consisted of hundreds of scientists from dozens of labs around the world. What were the findings? The results were published in a set of 29 scientific papers and in a special issue of the journal Nature in 2012. The results revealed that 80% of our DNA was functional and this will likely go to 100% with further research. Did you just read Wikipedia when preparing for this video or something? Yes, the junk DNA was shown to have a biochemical effect, meaning that they had some minor effect on things like enzyme levels within single cells within the body. They don't shape how you form, but they do have some effect on things like how susceptible to certain diseases you might be. 
In 2014, PLOS Genetics, a peer-reviewed open-access journal, published a paper called The Case for Junk DNA, which attempted to refute many of ENCODE's findings. The debate over whether ENCODE's findings mean anything significant and how DNA functions is still going on. Rather than being useless, meaning junk, the portions of DNA that do not code for making proteins contain about four main switches that control when our genes turn on and off and how much protein they make. Um, as you stated, only a small portion of DNA controls how protein is made. You stated it yourself, only 3% of it actually serves that purpose, so conflating that to God's design is really silly. If I got only 3% of something right, I am clearly wrong. These not only affect all the cells and organs in our body, but they do this at different points in our lifetime. Now let's take a closer look at DNA, a highly complex molecule. Our alphabet has 26 letters. The DNA code uses only four different letters called bases. Going to have to stop you briefly and then let you finish. DNA doesn't use letters. DNA can't spell. We use those letters as shorthand for the types of bases when we map DNA to make understanding the DNA sequence easier. But continue. Our entire DNA sequence is called a genome. The human DNA code is three billion letters long. It would take a person typing 60 words per minute at eight hours a day 50 years to type the entire genome. Okay, let's speed this up and get to a point. Although written thousands of years ago, King David's words about our marvelous human body still prove to be true. When we read in Psalm 139 verse 14, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. You once again spewed off a ton of facts about DNA, but didn't make one claim or even one point that refutes the idea of evolution. All you did was go, this looks complex. God must have done it, which is basically what you did in part one. Is this all I can expect from a channel that claims to be devoted to training people on creation? You comb Wikipedia for a bunch of fun facts and then go, God did it because I have a single Bible verse? Let's try part three. Hopefully this guy can make a single worthwhile point. And here in part three, we're going to talk about the 2% difference. The common perception is that humans and chimpanzees are only 2% different in our DNA. Biology textbooks promote this idea. Many university professors teach that we're close relatives, and many science journals promote this idea. In 2012, the American Association for Advanced Science had an article in the journal Science that stated, Ever since researchers sequenced the chimp DNA in 2005, they have known that humans share about 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees, making them our closest living relatives. So far so good, completely factual so far, but I'm waiting for a point. I'm going to skip over this a little just to get to the meat of his argument. I have the link in the description to the original video if you want to look. Comparisons of the whole genome, not just selected parts, have now revealed even greater differences of over 20%. John Sanford, PhD in genetics, states, In fact, we know man and chimp differ at more than 150 million nucleotide positions. Jay Wild, PhD in nuclear chemistry, states, Early on, it was widely thought that human DNA and chimp DNA were 99% similar. It should be noted that most of the quotes in this stretch are from Jay Weil, a known young Earth creationist whose doctorate is in nuclear chemistry, not anything close to biology. He's best known for being the author of the Exploring Creation With series, published by Apologia Educational Ministries. As well, these quotes are being taken off of his blog, not from any reputable source. That was based on a very limited analysis of only a minute fraction of human and chimp DNA. Genome-wide, only 70% of the chimpanzee DNA was similar to human under the most optimal sequence slice conditions. The overall extreme continuity between the two genomes defies evolutionary timescales and dogmatic presuppositions about a common ancestor. And finally, Jerry Bergman, PhD in human biology, and Jeffrey Tompkins, PhD in genetics state, 
The DNA sequence differences and genetic mechanisms reported in the literature support the conclusion that significant and unbridgeable genetic differences exist between humans and chimpanzees that defy evolutionary claims of a common ancestor. In a nutshell, his argument is that chimps and humans aren't as closely related as people previously thought. Okay, great. Now link that to creation. Now what can we conclude from all of this? Well, let's take a look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So you went through all of that, brought up how chimps and humans aren't as closely related as we thought, but still fairly related, and then threw that all out the window? How does your Bible verses have any bearing on the rest of this video? You just took over four minutes of my life with that video that you just summed up with, the Bible says it, so I believe it. Maybe part four is better, because so far this guy is not proving to be an intellectual heavyweight. Welcome to Bible Answers for today, where we talk about God's creation and how to defend our faith. We're in a four-part series called Mankind, God's Greatest Creation. In part one, we discuss the incredible human body that defies evolution. In part two, we expose the myth of junk DNA. In part three, we debunk the so-called 2% DNA difference between humans and chimpanzees. Before I let him get into the meat of his argument in part four, I just have to laugh at how he claims to have debunked things. I have yet to hear him make one cogent point on anything yet, but continue, crazy old Bible thumper, tell me the good word. And in this final session, we're going to talk about the fossil record. Does it support or prove humans evolved by naturalistic processes? And our challenge question for this series has been, did humans really evolve over millions of years by naturalistic processes, or were we created by an all-knowing, all-powerful Creator God? So far, you've shown a lot of evidence for evolution, and not one single shred of evidence for creation, so I'm going with evolution so far. But I will give you one last shot. This is part four of a four-part series. Give me something, anything. The common perception is that the fossil evidence supports humans evolved from ape-like creatures. The idea has been promoted with charts and textbooks depicting human evolution. Let's just take a look at the facts. Piltdown Man, discovered in 1912 in Piltdown, England. What was found? Fragments of a human-like skull, jawbone fragments similar to apes, and several teeth. It was claimed to be 500,000 years old. The New York Times ran an article then, Darwin Theory is Proved True. The scientific community celebrated the discovery as the long-awaited missing link between ape and man. For over 40 years, Piltdown models were displayed around the world and taught in schools as proof of human evolution. Well, let's look at the rest of the story. In 1953, the newspapers reported the real story. Piltdown Man was a hoax. Yep, Piltdown Man was a hoax. So far, completely factual. Continue. Zenjanthropus, discovered in 1959. What was found? Portions of a skull, jawbones, and some teeth. It was claimed to be 1.75 million years old. An article in the National Geographic claimed it to be the earliest man yet found and obviously human. The rest of the story. In 1961, two years after the discovery, Zenjanthropus was downgraded. It was just another ape-like creature. Nice of you to start with a known hoax, then characterize this one as a mistake. Zenjanthropus, also known as Paranthropus boise, is understood to have existed between 2.3 and 1.2 million years ago, according to the Smithsonian National Museum's website, link in the description. It's not an ape-like species, it's considered to be one of the many side branches of human evolution. Rambopithecus, discovered in 1932. It was claimed to be over 12 million years old. What was found? A few teeth and some fragments of a jawbone. Time Magazine in 1977 ran an article, Ramapithecus is ideally structured to be an ancestor of hominids. If it isn't, we don't have anything else that is. Well, the rest of the story. A baboon living in Ethiopia was found with a very similar jaw and tooth structure. As a result, Ramapithecus was dropped from the human evolution line. It was just another ape. Actually, Ramapithecus isn't based on a modern ape. It's actually 12 million years old, but it was claimed to be human-like by its discoverers when it was first found. But later discoveries found it was actually a specimen of Sivapithecus. 
But again, you started with a hoax, then characterized a human ancestor as an ape, and now it's onto errors being sensationalized in the media. For example, the Daily Mail ran a story on a man who supposedly married a 10-foot cobra. This, however, was a complete fabrication. It's a hoax. But it got sensationalized by the media because it was found to be interesting to the public, to the point of making this man look like a loon, all for the sake of selling papers. Using the idea that the media run stories later found to be an error is silly, because while we may think something about science one minute, our understanding of reality changes and adapts to better reflect reality. So what you claim is somehow proof against evolution is in fact actually proof that science works. It's the media that's the issue. Lucy, one of the famous Australopithecines, was found in Ethiopia in 1974, considered to be one of the first in line to be human. Less than 40% of the fossil was found. It was claimed to be 3.2 million years old and claimed she could walk upright. Well, the rest of the story. Lucy stood 3 feet 6 inches tall, the same size as a chimpanzee. The skulls of Australopithecines are very ape-like. The brain size is estimated to be one-third the size of humans. Lucy's pelvic bone was identical to a chimpanzee, meaning it did not walk upright. The fingers are long and curved like an ape. The wrists are locking wrists for knuckle walking like apes, not humans. The rib cage was cone shaped like an ape, not barrel shaped like humans. The feet of Australopithecines are like apes and not humans. The arms are long and the legs are short like an ape. A new analysis shows that Lucy's upper limbs were heavily built, similar to tree climbing chimpanzees. In other words, Lucy looked like an ape, she walked like an ape, and she was the same size as a chimpanzee. The fossil evidence indicates that Lucy was simply an extinct ape and not a human ancestor. Actually, the evidence was that Lucy walked upright most of the time. Yes, yeah, she may have had traits that allowed her to move in other ways, but the evidence points to her walking upright. Her species had adapted to move from living in trees to the ground and back again, and is a very early ancestor, which is why she looks closer to a chimp than human. This doesn't invalidate her as a human ancestor, if anything it strengthens the evolutionary model if you actually understood it, but you seem fixated on trying to define all early humans as apes. Neanderthals, first discovered in 1856. The original drawings were very ape-like, making it look pre-human. The rest of the story. They made jewelry. They used musical instruments. They buried their dead, much like modern funerals. They were capable of speech. Their brain capacity was slightly larger than the average human today. They made advanced tools. They had certain physical characteristics like a thick brow ridge and wide nasal cavity. However, nothing in their anatomy differs from human abilities today, and even their DNA is within the human range. Neanderthals are another example of artistic imagination and an uncritical commitment to evolution rather than good science. All these discoveries have shown that Neanderthals were fully human, descendants ultimately from Adam and Eve. Um, wow, that's a stretch. Yes, they look and act very human because they are our closest relative in the fossil record. They're dated to be from around 40,000 to 400,000 years ago, which puts it well before creationist scholars put the age of the Earth. So claiming them as descendants of Adam and Eve doesn't help your narrative. Homo erectus, meaning upright man or upright ape man, they are claimed to have lived between 1.9 million years ago and 143,000 years ago. Well, the rest of the story. They are identical to Neanderthals, except smaller in size. From the neck down, they resembled an Olympic power athlete of today. The scientific analysis has shown they are completely human. Homo erectus is just another case of evolution imagination. Actually, they aren't. Even just examining the different shape of the skull is enough to tell they are very different. They're close, because they are close together on the evolutionary path to humans, but they are not the same species. And worse, they are dated as being up to 1.89 million years our ancestor, and you did a video claiming the geological timescale is only measured in the thousands, mainly because of carbon dating, a method we don't use on fossils for reasons you even mention in your video. Link in the description. Conclusion. The track record is... An initial claim of a new fossil find that proves evolution, and later the fossil is downgraded or dismissed. Yes, by you, not by the scientific community, who has reached very different conclusions for the ones you claim. You seem to have some special knowledge about evolutionary theory that scientists the world over seem to lack, don't you? Is it possible you might be wrong? In every case, the fossil evidence that has been used to prove evolution and discredit the Bible has been proven to be false. We can always go back to the original facts found in the Bible.
Let's say for the sake of argument that you're right, and scientists everywhere all got it wrong. Let us, for the sake of argument, say evolution is wrong. How does that possibly get us to creation is true, read your Bible? To prove creation, you need to prove creation. You don't prove creation by disproving everything else. Your pet theory isn't suddenly true because another theory is wrong. If I can provide proof that Tooth Fairy isn't buying kids' teeth, that doesn't then prove my alternate theory of alien tooth abductions. In short, you've managed to steal almost half an hour of my life away with these videos without providing one shred of evidence to back up the claim of creation. I hope you're happy with yourself. That's it for me. Please rate, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you next time.